Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Omar. I'll be facilitating today's session. We're excited to have members of KPMG's corporate tax incentives team here to discuss developing an approach for accessing government incentives, SHRED in particular. Before we get into it, I want to share a few quick housekeeping notes with you. We're going to start the webinar with a presentation and we'll have a dedicated Q&A period at the end. Throughout the session, please do feel free uh, to ask questions by clicking on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We're recording today's session um, as there's a lot of really great content to cover uh, in these 45 minutes that we have together. So you'll be emailed a copy of the recordings uh, in the next few days. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, so with that, let's jump in. Uh, so to start, um, let me tell you a little bit about Ankle um, and why we're bringing you this session. So to start, um, I started Ankle four and a half years ago. Um, we, had a, we have a head office here in Vancouver um, with a global delivery model, so satellite office in India, just outside of Delhi. To date, we've worked with over 300 companies across Canada. Um, and we really provide outsourced accounting services to businesses and not-for-profit organizations in these four categories, bookkeeping, payroll, payables, and receivables. We deliver our service using a combination of people, process, and technology. So since starting the business, um, I have seen a number of our clients access uh, Shred, and it's been actually quite um, interesting to see how Shred has been able to transform some of these clients and really help uh, some of our entrepreneurial clients achieve their dreams. So uh, I'm excited to, uh, to you know, provide a little bit more insight uh, through this uh, team of, of uh, experts from KPMG on how you might be able to go about accessing Shred. Our speakers today, so I'll just briefly introduce myself. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Omar. Um, I'm the CEO of Ankle. I have uh, 13 years of experience. Prior to starting Ankle, I was actually on the KPMG team. So Kristen and I go way back. Um, I have 13 years of experience, um, worked in tax advisory um, for a number of those years. Uh, currently, um, I work with a number of companies in Canada to provide them, you know, me, me and my team to provide them with accurate bookkeeping and reporting services. Um, and then there's Kristen, a senior manager at KPMG, over 12 years of experience uh, in accounting and tax. Uh, and she specialized in Canadian tax and shred for the last nine of those, of those years. Uh, and then there's Stephen. Um, who I've gotten to know over the past uh, year or so. Stephen has over 14 years of experience working with technology companies, um, particularly uh, in the area of software development. And he has specialized in shred claims for soft, uh, as mentioned, uh, shred claims for software and technology companies. Um, that is what we see um, really as, uh, you know, a lot of our clients being in technology. Um, leveraging Stephen and his team. Uh, Shred does apply to other areas as well, so there will be some relevant takeaways for people uh, from other industries as well. Great, let's do a quick poll. So before we get started, I uh, just want to do a quick temperature check on our audience here. Um, on your screen, there it is. Um, so we'll just ask you to um, answer a couple of these questions for us. So one, is your company currently claiming shred credits today? And are you claiming more than 50% of your R&D wages if you are claiming shred? All right. Thanks for submitting your answers. 
I'll now hand it off to the experts, Kristen and Stephen from KPMG. Oh, actually, before we do that, let's quickly look at the results. So is your company currently claiming shred? Um, yes, 46%, no, 38%. Um, currently no, but I have in the past 15%. And then are you claiming more than 50% of your R&D wages? Uh, 23% of you said yes, 15% said no, and of course, that was not applicable to some of you. Thank you. All right, over to our experts. Hi, so, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Steven. Uh, yes, thank you for taking the poll. Uh, it's good to see that some has, uh, some have shred experience and some don't. Uh, you know, if you want to contact us, that'd be great. <laughs> but uh, in general, yeah, um, that, that poll is just to determine like the level of knowledge of, of the Shred program and, you know, how we can tailor the presentation. Anyways, uh, what is Shred? So Shred stands for Scientific Research and Experimental Development. It's the single largest, um, you know, program for uh, business R&D in Canada. So it's different than, you know, academic research or university. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this program is to fund uh, R&D in businesses with, you know, practical applications. Uh, there's, I think some of these numbers might be a bit off, but there's over, you know, 3 billion in, in tax incentives to over, you know, thousands and thousands of claimants. Um, you know, for sure, some of the big ones back then were like, you know, BlackBerry and EA Sports. But again, a lot of, like, pretty much any company that is doing app development or any development for that matter, should, should, should try to apply for this uh, program. Um, you know, majority of the strike claims are, well, not majority, but half, especially in Canada, is, is, is related to the IT and uh, software sector. Um, and uh, yeah, the, like Omar said in the, in the past, like a lot of people are taking up this program because it is very lucrative. So if you're paying a developer, like say, uh, you know, 100,000, uh, you, you pretty much save half the cost rate if you're, uh, uh, qualifying CCPC or a Canadian controlled private corporation. And if you're not, again, you, you get a lower rate, but still like taking off 30% off a developer that's working on, on shred related items is huge for a lot of startups and companies. Yeah. Uh, so the goal today is, you know, to, I guess the key takeaways that we want to, you know, leave you with is, you know, provide you a common understanding or good understanding of what is shred, what is not shred, and how, how it plays in with other tax incentives and grants, like, you know, the wage subsidy and IRAP, and also just uh, let you know how, uh, go through examples of what, what, what would qualify for a, a tech company. Uh, hold on. So, yeah, so again, the first part we're going to talk about is calculating the shred benefits. So that would mean to be Kristen, and then I would be talking about the, you know, the definition of shred and, and the approach that CRA uses for determining the eligibility of work. And also, again, examples of advancements and uncertainties, and yeah. Hi, everyone. I am Kristen, and I am a... Uh... Tax Specialist uh, CA or CPA CA. Um, and I will go over some of the more financial things. So as Stephen said, this is one of the largest um, government programs that we have for uh, often startup companies, like a lot of you may be in the beginning stages. Um, I don't know that it was spoken about on the slide, but I think it's something like 70% of, of shred is paid out to uh, small and medium-sized businesses. So it's very lucrative to um, companies, especially in that kind of beginning stages of the business. Um, in a year like this year, where COVID's kind of taken um, businesses in a different direction, uh, SHRED has been used and recognized by the government as an assistance for companies to, to try to stay um, afloat. So just some things to think about about as in the coming year. So, so there's kind of two parts of shred. So we have the qualified expenditures that are deductible and 
when we claim shred, it allows us to carry them forward indefinitely. So it allows us to give you some flexibility in your tax planning structures. So similar to uh, CCA, if you're familiar with your um, amortization for taxes, it can be used when it benefits your company. So if you're in a non taxable position at this stage and you know in two or three years you expect to be, these costs can be carried forward reducing your taxable income in the future. The second half, which is kind of the more exciting half um, to start out with, are the investment tax credits. So that is where you are either, you either receive a tax credit refund or can apply credits against your taxes. If you receive non-refundable credits, um, they can either be carried back for three years. So if in 2017, let's say, you were taxable and you're not this year, they can be applied then and those taxes can be funded or they can be carried forward as long as 20 years. So again, a planning strategy in the, in the future. So depending on the tax status, they may be refundable. So this is just a slide that outlines what, what we can claim in the calculating the tax credit. So the biggest thing for most of our clients is our salaries and wages. So this is for work that's done by employees that are directly engaged in SRNED, which we'll get into the definition of that shortly, and for work performed in Canada. So Canadian employees working on SRNED in Canada. Um, if you are not kind of on the software sides of things, there can be some materials. This usually we see more in manufacturing, food services, that, that sort of thing, where materials are being consumed or prototypes are being developed um, as part of the R&D. For non-employees, um, we can claim contractors as well. So whether that's uh, bringing in a contractor solely to perform work similar to an employee, or uh, a contract to do work that's outside of the scope of your staff. Um, they can be claimed if they are doing R&D work. Um, this is capped at 80%. Um, that's just to ensure that there's not a, a doubling up of, of costs with write-ups. Um, Third-party payments, similar to contract costs, it's when you're getting benefits from from research performed at universities. I'm trying to think of something. I know in the forestry industry, there's quite a few of these, um, but benefiting you where you're not controlling the work being done is kind of the the overall arching thing there and then overhead expenditures so this is a big thing for especially salary claims we can either claim it on in what's called a traditional method which is where we track overheads and uh, claim them as actual overhead or in cases of companies with high salaries or claiming salaries in general um, there's a markup of 55 percent um, against salary. So this can be highly beneficial to, to a salary-based um, entity, and we see that a lot in, in software and development. So this kind of just runs through the costs and how they're applied. So you'd add, add all of your costs, and then there is um, the deduction of government assistance. So this is a question we often get is, you know, I'm getting IRAP for my staff. Or I, or I have, am getting SUS is, is a really common one right now, um, or getting provincial funding in some, some fac factor. And, uh, you know, we hear a lot, oh, I can't claim shred because I have these. It, it offsets my full, my full wage. Well, the reality is, is it comes, it comes up after. So we always look to ensure that, you know, IRAP is usually at 80% of a salary. So you would get 20% of a salary. Plus the big benefit there is if we're doing a proxy claim, um, you would also get that 55% write up on the full amount claimed. So, so there are benefits and we'll walk through a full example later on today um, of using and leveraging these uh, shred with other government assistance. Um, there's also non-government assistance. So that would be if you're getting paid for work performed on behalf of somebody else. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well on on how contracts are set up and whether or not uh, they need to be applied against your SR and ED. But uh, there are instances when if you're being paid for work done, that that would also be removed. So there's federal credits, which as we spoke about before, are either non-refundable, which is at a 15% rate, which would be applied against taxes payable, or 35% refundable rate. So that's the preferential rate for Canadian controlled private corps. 
um, who have the definition is later, I believe, but taxable capital less than 10 million and it begins to be capped over 10 million under 50 million. So we can talk about that a little bit more as well as provincial in BC, that's a 10% credit. If you, ha if you have work done in other provinces, it, it ranges from I think 3.5 in Ontario to 17 in some provinces in the East. So, so there's that on top of your federal credit. So this is just a, a slide going into a little bit more of the considerations of government grants and assistance or tax credits. So that doesn't mean that you're receiving government grants does not mean that it's not eligible for shred. So that's kind of the big, the big thing that we want to drive home to everybody. Um, there can be a costing offset um, depending on the relationship to the work performed. That's a big part of what we do um, at our firm is to ensure that we are we are comparing apples to apples and that the funding received is only being applied against the SRNED being claimed um, to make sure that we're not offsetting too much in our, our claims. So, so there would be an adjustment, generally speaking, but, but any amount in excess of that is always claimed for SRNED as well as the proxy amount. So this goes into the, the, the claiming the credit. So there's the two tax rates and you're either eligible for a 35 refundable rate. So this is the Canadian controlled private corp, which most of our clients, I wish I shouldn't say most, but a lot of our clients are. Um, basically this is any company that's controlled. So 51% or more, or alternatively, if you have unrelated share shareholders, it could be slightly different, um, Canadian resident shareholders. So most private companies that we see at the stages that we see are CCPCs. Um, so the first $3 million of SRNED expenditures are applicable to this 35% rate, assuming their taxable capital is less than 10 million. There's a sliding scale beyond 10 million. Um, and anything above that uh, reduced uh, refundable pool will be charged at the 15% non-refundable rate. Um, and then 15% non-refundable is available to anyone else. That's resident in Canada, so I should specify that. Um, it's not eligible for non-resident companies. Uh, so Stephen, I will send this back to you to talk about the definition. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the definition of shred, so scientific research and experimental development, most of the shred claims we see, or I guess even CRACs is more in the later half, which is the uh, experimental development side. And that's actually defined in the Income Tax Act, subsection 241 of the Income Tax Act, if you're interested. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just read it off as is, because I think this is like, uh, the key, right? Like as long as you're able to show that your work meets this definition, um, uh, it would be good. Um, so, you know, systematic investigation or search that is carried out in a field of science or technology by means of experiments or analysis. So field of technology, mainly, well, for software claims, it'll be mainly software engineering or other fields of te technology. Say if you're doing, I don't know, FinTech or HR technology. So as long as it's in some field of technology uh, and you're advancing that field, then you should qualify. Again, CRE doesn't really have those fields listed in, in the shred write-ups or the, the templates in that they only say software engineering, but you could definitely uh, you know, put that in the report. Um, and why? So why shred? Uh, so it's for the advancement of uh, scientific knowledge or I guess technical knowledge or the purpose of achieving advancements, right? Um, and that's what experimental development is. Uh, next slide, uh, okay. So there's, so CRA has, you know, published a application policy or, or you know, provided more examples of how they want to determine whether something shred. So they use this two-step methodology. The first step is, again, to determine if your work is shred or eligible for shred and then the second step is to determine 
you know, how much of that work is shredded. And I can go into each one. Um, so, so over the years, I think there was a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, people, uh, there's misinterpretations and there was a lot of conflict between CRAs and, and claimants. So what they've done is they've come up with these five questions to kind of try to give more guidance of, you know, what they are looking for. So these five questions uh, are mainly, you know, was there a technological uncertainty, which is the key question. I think if you don't have a technological uncertainty or you're not able to prove it to the CRA, uh, the rest of the questions don't really matter. But once you are able to show that there's a technological uncertainty, uh, then question two would be, you know, where, was it, did the effort involve, involve uh, formulating hypotheses or I guess solutions aimed at reducing the uncertainty? And then three was, was the approach, you know, consistent with a systematic uh, investigation or testing the hypothesis? And then number four was the work for the purpose of achieving a technological advancement. And five, uh, you know, were, you know, do you have any documentation showing, you know, the experiments or uh, as the work progressed? In summary, uh, that's pretty much, you need to show, you know, what, you know was there a techno technology improvement? Not, you know, well, we, we came up with these new features, but more, you know, was there improvement to the underlying technologies to enable those features? And then number two is, you know, you just need to prove that the work is not routine. Uh, there's many ways of doing that, but I'll uh, go into it later. And then the number three is just to show that, yeah, the, the approach that, you know, the solution that you've developed, it wasn't as simple as, you know, we found the first one or we've, you know, did some research, we, we implemented a solution and it all worked. Uh, they, they really want to hear the iterations, the failures, you know, all the steps in between to get to the final solution. Uh, next slide. So yeah, so technological uncertainty, right? I think this word is very vague or just um, different people have different interpretations of it. Uh, you know, in CRA's definition, it's, it's whether a given result or objective can be achieved or it's not known based on generally available knowledge. Um, that's vague in that they, uh, you know, you can't just say, oh, I, I didn't know how to achieve my objective or this hasn't been done before uh, and that usually will get your your uh, shred claim audited uh, they, they, you need to take it another step further and really you know describe uh, you know the existing no, uh, level of technology or, or even the knowledge base within the company and the public domain like say on stack overflow or whatever right like as long as you're able to quantify that and describe that knowledge base and show why that was not adequate to solve your problem um, uh, that will help uh, prevent an audit from the CRA. Um, here are some examples that I put down. Uh, you know, like a lot of times I see like these system integration projects. So, you know, component A and B were not designed to work together. Um, you know, that's, that's a good uncertainty, but not definitely not the strongest one. You know, um, the second example, like, you know, will a certain library or certain tool perform adequately under your constraints or your environment? I think that's generally a good area for shred or to show technological uncertainty because, you know, CRA likes performance and, and scalability challenges. Um, the third one, the, you know, this, this, the insufficient documentation uh, to determine if a component is a good choice or not, or a library or, or, or uh, a framework. Uh, you know, I think that that could be uncertainty, but again, C I think CRA tend to err on the side of saying that's not eligible. Uh, yeah, and the rest, like, you know, how, how will the system scale under load? So scalability challenges, performance, again, there's, that's good. Uh, you know, integrating your, you know, uh, off the shelf, libraries into your own framework and making it work. Uh, that's also a good example of an uncertainty. Uh, yeah, and, and algorithms in general, like if you're not able to find a certain algorithm or you need to customize or, or modify existing algorithms to meet your needs, that's also a good sign of a technological uncertainty. Okay, uh, so the other is, so technological advancements, 
So examples would be, again, performance improvements. I know, you know a lot of projects aren't mainly focused on performance improvements, but from a CRA standpoint, if you're able to you know, really highlight those, uh, you know, any, any uh, quantifiable measures in terms of like, you know, especially for software, right? like memory usage, uh, scalability, any, anything after the work that you've done and you're able to show in it, uh, even just an incremental improvement, that, that would really show a uh, technological advancement. Um, prototyping, definitely another area for eligible shred projects. Um, yeah, I think integration of software components. I think that's a very interesting area to really uh, to highlight for for strike claims. Uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of strike claims, and most of the comments I get back from our clients are like, "Well, oh, no, we're just using off-the-shelf components. Uh, we're not doing anything new." And again, if you're able to just frame the the work or description in a way that shows that you know the integration or how you're taking these components and and creating a new solution out of it um, that would uh, be justifiable to the CRA. Uh, other obvious ones or not too obvious ones, architectural improvements. So for soft software architectures, especially if you're improving the architecture in terms of you know, um, the efficiency or even some type of refactoring that, that could qualify that most people tend to just leave out. Uh, framework extensions that just automatically qualifies. Um, yeah, and, and new algorithms. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is kind of a slide that I created based on uh, what we've uh, you know learned over the years and try to really help clients with framing the, the project better. Um, you know, the top box you see is the kind of the developer or company's view, and the bottom is what, you know, how we would try to describe the work in terms of the actual technology stack and how you're, you know, removing obstacles to to uh, improve it, right? And that's what CRA, uh, you know, that's where CRA looks at eligibility. If you're, you know, setting in a, in a write-up about a project that describes features and no one has done before, uh, most likely you will get a phone call from the CRA. But if you're really taking the project and trying to, again, brainstorm and, and map out how the features are related to the different areas of technologies that you're using and talk about you know, what challenges you had to overcome in those technologies to enable those features, um, definitely will set you apart from other claimants and will you know, uh, get you uh, a bit more success with the strike claim. Okay, so that's all step one <laughs> in terms of determining if the work's eligible. Step two is again determining the extent of the uh, the eligible work. So you need to show that you know, the work is in one of these categories, like engineering, design, operation, research, analysis, mathematical analysis, programming, testing. So again, if you notice that this is under what they call support work, so. You know, like with especially programming, programming itself, like if you get down to the level of, of coding, that is not eligible by itself. That's why they call it support work. So as long as it's supporting a eligible shred project, that's why it qualifies, but programming in itself is not eligible. Uh, I can go into that further if anyone has questions in the Q&A, but the other pro point I want to drive home here is uh, the company project versus shred project. Um, Often people think that you know my company project should all should all qualify. Uh, that's you know it's, there are some cases that, that that could happen. Maybe like I don't know Tesla or something where they're creating a new uh, battery. But with most projects, it's usually a subset of that project that would qualify, and that's what CRA wants to see. The more you're able to establish a boundary between your company projects and shred projects, the better off you're in terms of a, a CRA audit. And uh, that's it for me. Um, so now we can go through a quick example now that we have a little bit of an understanding of what can be claimed for shred. And we thought it would make sense to go through a um, uh, sample where we talked about a uh, straight shred claim uh, with no government funding and then one with government funding and um, talking about Sue since that's really relevant right now.
So just, just so that everybody knows, we're making the assumption in this example that all time spent on Sue's was also time spent on shred. That's likely not the case uh, in, in, a, in a real life example, but of course we have to boil this down to the most simplest um, uh, steps here. Um, so if we have wages of 100,000, contractors of expenses of 50,000, and then possibility of Sue's of 30,000. Um, can I have the next slide, please? This is how we would run through our, our benefit. So we would have the same costs and the same proxy um, up until line, sorry, these are not numbered, up until we see the shred eligible expenditures. In scenario one, where we don't have any government assistance, we'd have total costs available for ITC of 195,000 versus 165,000 if we have SUS. So our, uh, our provincial credit, which offsets against the federal credit amount, is lower in the case of SUS, um, meaning that our federal expenditures, again, for both, is higher without SUS and lower with SUS, um, resulting in lower overall credits. But when we look at the total benefit, um, taking into account the fact that SUS is also funds received by your company, you'll see that there's about an $18,000 difference. Um, and that's a benefit to, to your company if you're able to, to receive both. So as you can see, your, your credit may be smaller. You are still eligible aside from that amount, but your overall benefit is larger. So in many cases, it makes sense to apply for whatever um, government assistance your company would qualify for. So here's kind of just some points to remember as we're thinking about, uh, about shred going forward, that technology is, is knowledge and, and not a physical thing. So we're looking at the, the knowledge of how the, the system works to develop, to develop, to deliver the features. We always need to look at the methodology and the five questions that CRA is gonna ask. In the case of an audit, CRA is always going to go back to those five questions. So it applies to software development as in any other field. And I'm sorry, I, we, we have reviewed the listing and a lot of you are in technology to anybody who's not. I know this has been very software focused, um, but we can talk about some other areas that we have uh, experience in, in, the, in the Q and A, because we do, do do work with all a, a varied um, number of companies. Um, and then identifying the technological knowledge base properly is extremely important. So that's something that um, we really recommend working with a specialist on because they have so much experience in this. And we see a lot of um, companies who don't necessarily have as, as much experience or understanding of it, um, unable to have a strong position to, for CRA. Stephen, do you want to talk to these ones here? Just they're they're more technological. Uh, yeah, I can talk about this. So limitations of technologies need to be articulated by correlating. So again, it's always within the context of your uh, company. Uh, for technological uncertainty, you would definitely want to, again, tr try to define that knowledge base. You know, uh, you, there may be a competitor that already has, you know, developed similar solutions to what you're doing or solve that problem, but it's not shared. So again, as a, you're able to really um, quantify or, or, or elaborate on that knowledge base and why it's not adequate for what you're trying to do, the, the, the better, the stronger your shred case is you know, going, taking it on another level higher than just say, I, I didn't know it would work or not. Um, again, shred is very uh, counterintuitive. Uh, a lot of people always talk about the, you know, the success or benefits to the end user, but for shred purposes, we really want to show them why the, the, that solution doesn't ex uh, won't succeed or, or it wasn't able to meet the objectives like failure is definitely a uh, it's a good thing for shred um, and then the last one uh, record record of hypotheses tested and results generated so 
Yeah, I mean, CRA's golden standard is that there's timesheets and that you have almost a, a research paper for each of your shred projects. But, you know, uh, over the years, we've uh, worked with the CRA and even been on with them on uh, practitioner uh, sessions where we've talked about what we're seeing with claimants. And again, that it doesn't really match up to that, like especially business R&D where there isn't a formal process like in uh, academia. Um, so we have come up with alternative ways to um, I guess support SRED claims without creating too much overhead for clients. So one other thing that we just wanted to uh, touch on is other government grants and credits. So Stephen and I are fairly centered in, in SRED, um, but we do have a uh, specialist in our group, Jacqueline Gustafson. I don't know if any of you, you may have come across uh, working with her, um, who specializes in government grants and credits in addition to SRNED. So we have um, a program where we can assist people in reviewing the work that's being done by a company and matching them with relevant assistance. Um, going on this year and we've, we've had a lot of success with it um, including sometimes you know she has her eye on the pulse and knows about credits that are op only open for um, a very short period and one example she had of that was the IRAP uh, innovation assistance program and this was a program that assisted a lot of companies who didn't qualify for SUES but were able to um, get a subsidy for wages it was very similar to SUES for technology companies now they only accepted um, applications for a week and it was a three month program. And now it looks like, she said, I think as of Friday that they're gonna be extending the program and re, um, reopening applications. So things like this are things that you know we specialize in. So something that we do is, like I said, we can produce a report and then also should clients choose, assist in the application process for um, receiving these funds. I'm gonna let you guys just read through the slides for a couple seconds here on what the credits are. They're fairly self-explanatory um, and can probably be looked at later. This is just a small sample of, of what's available, but it's it can be good to have somebody look at it because they have kind of a database of, of everything available that's not always known about by our clients. So here we go. How can we assist you? KPMG can assist you. Um, and, and here are some of the ways. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, we work in SRNED and grants almost exclusively. Um, so some ways that we help our clients is, is tax planning to maximize your shred eligibility. That's one of the perks that KPMG really has is both our experience, um, myself, our other um, tax accountants and Ed Zakrak, the partner in our group, all have um, tax experience. We've all taken um, our in-depth tax course and work very closely with our um, enterprise and uh, corporate tax groups. So we can assist not only in the shred eligibility portion, but also tax planning to maximize your eligibility. So things like setting up your corporation such that you would qualify for the CCPC high rate. Um, that's something that isn't available by all practitioners um, because they don't all have the tax experience. Um, we do full service shred preparation. So we assist with preparing the claim, inputting and filing the claim, and then should you be selected for CRA audit, supporting the claim. We will always support a claim if it goes to a CRA audit. We do not file work that we don't think can be supported in an audit. Um, and then, as I was just speaking about previously, um, our tax incentives and government grant review and application submission. So our grant specialist reviews all the grants, what might be eligible based on your work, um, your structure, etc., and can be engaged to assist in the application. Again, one of our pluses is not only that we have all this extensive tax uh, work, we regularly work with Ankle and other tax firms to streamline our services with our mutual clients. One of the things we really try to do is maintain um, a streamlined service and uh, make it as easy on our clients as possible to file their returns without a headache. So um, there can be many uh, moving parts and we try to work with uh, everyone to make it go as smoothly as possible.
So Omar, I'll send it back to you. Great, thank you, Kristen and Stephen, uh, for taking the time to share your knowledge on SHRED and other incentive programs. Let's jump into the questions. Um, so let's see what we have here. Um, so there's one question that came in, um, and the question is, what does a CRA audit entail for SHRED? Yeah, uh, I, I can answer that. I just got off an hour call to talk with the client to how to best prepare for audit. So a CRA audit, uh, um, depending on the reviewer, it could be a pleasant experience or a very dramatic one. Uh, they will definitely want to do, you know, understand the business, the context of the company, uh, again, determine how the shred claim was put together and um, the technical, the review of the technical description. So that's actually the bulk of the review where they want to really look at whether the work qualifies from, you know, the, the, those five questions. Uh, they, they have their strategies on how they try to Again, their, their goal is not to really, I mean, there are some auditors that are trying to allow claims, but I, what I find most of the auditors are doing, like they're, they're trying to, uh, their goal is to deny the claim or cut back some of your claim. So how they do that is with their strategies of like taking your project and dividing it out to different areas or again, drilling down to the lowest activity level, which is again, like some of the supporting work, which I was saying about um, programming like say creating an API or, or creating a data model, you know, that, that by all means is, is, it is routine, but if it's routine work in support of shred, then that does qualify. And that's where I think it's really helpful to especially have people that have been in the, in the shred game or, or, you know, have, have a lot of experience in shred to be there when you're uh, talking to the CRA so that they're not just doing what they want. Great, thank you for that, Stephen. Um, another question that came in is, what percentage of the claim do you charge for shred work? Um, I can take that and I can talk a little bit more just about how we structure our fees in general. So I can't really give a percentage that we charge on all claims because it's not standard across the board. Um, we structure our payments very much based on our client and our client relationship. Um, so we do contingent fees, a percentage or stepped contingent fees, um, hourly fees, fixed fees. It really depends on what you're filing, what, uh, whether you've had audits in the past, whether you, what type of work you're doing, the activity, um, what your expectations are in how we perform the work. So whether or not you are coming to us with completed reports that we are reviewing, uh, or whether we're coming up from scratch and going all the way back to data code to prepare the reports. So it's really hard to say what uh, a general percentage is because it's not the same with any client. Um, it's very um, specific. Um, there are certain cases that we do not charge a percentage no matter what. For example, an SEC registrant audit client, we cannot charge a contingent fee. So um, it's not a blanket for everyone. So unfortunately, I can't give a, a straight answer on that, but we do ensure that it's fairly, um, fairly assessed based on the work being performed and the, the client itself and their, their financial status. Great, thank you for that, Kristen. Um, I know that I read something a while ago about processing times changing for shred claims in light of COVID-19. Can you shed a little bit of light on that? How have the processing times changed? Yeah, so I, um, we've been seeing really quick turnarounds. There was a kind of a lull when, when COVID first happened and, and everybody was getting used to working from home. But we've been seeing really quick turnarounds um, for shred claims as quickly as one to two weeks um, of assessment if the claim is filed together with the originally processed return. So for example, um, right now it's August. So I guess that's February 2020 um, tax returns are due in August. There are currently um, extensions going on, but in a normal year, it would be six months after. And we are seeing if they're filed on time um, response within one to two weeks. Not always, we can't guarantee that, but we're seeing much faster than their, their, their typically um, listed service times. 
One thing to note is we are seeing now um, some audit activity is happening again. Everything is on uh, by telephone. They do teleconferences for it and submission online. And uh, we are seeing first time claimants reviews their or assistance, they're called, with almost every new file. Um, they are again done by telephone. When you have one of these meetings, nothing has changed, but it does extend the processing time, but we're still hearing from CRA within a couple of weeks. Okay, that's that's great to hear, thank you. Um, one question came up, uh, is it possible to file our claim ourselves? And maybe I'll add to that question, um, assuming you are able to file the claim yourself, you know, what risks might, might that present? Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely you can. It's almost like doing your own uh, tax return. You can definitely file your own strike claim. Um, the, 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 I would say the risk is like, it depends, right? Like if you're a, a, a technology company, like say purely in tech, like say you're, you're an Amazon or Microsoft where you're developing a new database or programming language, that wouldn't be a too big of a risk area, but if you're in, in different areas, like say marketing or marketing tech, uh, ERP implementations, configurations, things like that, where it's l less obvious as, as to whether it's shred, um, it, it could be a huge risk in that, you know, if you're not describing the work at the right level or, or you know, um, especially the obstacles and, and the, the work performed, you will get reviewed by CRA. And then at that time, you know, if they decide to deny your claim or your entire claim, then you would have a record on, on with the CRA. And, you know, the next year you fall, you will get, you know, audited again if you're going to claim the same thing. Um, so definitely you want to um, get off on the right foot with the CRA. We, we have clients that we've done before that they haven't been audited for, I don't know, 14 years or something like that since I first started in this uh, field and uh, yeah and we have we have clients that just has they, they've been reviewed by CRA and then every year they've been reviewing them year after year and it's a it's a process that you definitely don't want to uh, get into okay great thank you um, and I think uh, one final question here um, what type of work do you see that doesn't qualify for shred, but may be development or R and D related? Um, is there anything that that comes to mind there? Yeah, I would say like there's obvious, like not obvious things, but a lot of it is in the in the gray area. And okay, even like things like say, uh, I mean, I'm sure CRA would disagree with me, but. Uh, to user experience itself, which is a, okay. a key part of a lot of development, like that in itself, if you describe that in the report and sent it into CRA, yeah, you're going to get audited. But at the end of the day, I, I think you know, we position it right and we describe the, the, the key challenges, not just the user experience, but again, what you had to do to enable that. Uh, it would include that work as support, right? Um, you know, there's the real, really obvious stuff is like marketing and sales or accounting, right? Like all that would, would not be eligible. Uh, you know, in general, like say a big, big uh, system implementations or digital transformations, they'll look at it as, you know, routine development or routine uh, projects. But again, I think if you really uh, characterize the work properly and and, and uh, you know set up the foundation properly like of a house kind of uh, you know you you'll be able to have like successful strike claims year after year but this is that first step uh, that's so that's why a lot of these claims they did the majority of the time spent is actually not in uh, just trying to write up the right report it's actually spent in in framing it so that you're able to create this kind of framework so that you're able to update your your write-ups year after year Great, thank you, Stephen. Um, so I actually have a comment here from, from the audience uh, that I, I think I'll just share with everybody to wrap up. Um, and it was, uh, we use KPMG for shred and the major benefits are the analysis of the write-ups, the tax planning for future years and the assistance on calls and audits are a huge benefit. So thank you um, for that comment, really appreciate it. Um, so, so I think we will uh, end today's session there. Um, to our attendees, I wanna thank you for joining us today. We hope you learned a thing or two 
about Shred. And of course, if you have any more questions, feel free to get in touch with us. Our contact information is on the slide and we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar and the slide deck later. So keep a lookout for that and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.